kicking off a series here called The Cup. Uh, communion is, we would take communion because at the Last Supper, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he said, take this cup, which is my blood. But I want to let all of you rest easy. We're not going to eat anybody and we're not going to drink anybody's blood. It's a type. Um, but we want to talk the next few weeks about the cup. And as you read through the Bible, uh, from Genesis to Malachi, and then from Matthew to Revelation, you come across all kinds of verbiage and things about a cup. And it's represented in a lot of ways. And I want to cover a few of them. And as you read through the Bible, you'll come across all these feasts, banquets, meals, and they would have the feast of the Passover. Then they would have the feast of unleavened bread. They would have the feast of first fruits, the feast of weeks, which we call Pentecost, the feast of trumpets. Then they would have a feast to celebrate the Day of Atonement. They would have the Feast of Tabernacles. Then after the Jews were exiled, they added even more memorial days for the, when the fall of Jerusalem happened, the Feast of Dedication, or what we know as Hanukkah. Uh, then they would observe the Sabbath day every week, and they would have the Feast of the New Moon. They would have all these feasts. Now, this gives great justification and vindication to those of us who grew up in church that you know church people love to get together and eat. How many of y'all love to get together and just eat? Now, maybe you're, you're, we don't call them feasts. We don't call them, uh, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles. What, what we call them family reunions or barbecues. We're going to get together and have some barbecue. And, you know, we're going to celebrate. So what they would do is they would declare, God would say, you, you need to remember this day. Or there was something major that happened or impactful in their lives. And then every year on that day, they would gather together. They would celebrate on that day to remember what the Lord had done for them, they would commemorate that day. So, you know, in this nation, we, we do it on July the 4th. We commemorate that day to remember that on July the 4th of 1776, we became independent. And so we celebrate that. We, we sort of do the same thing. We begin to put days up to celebrate impactful days in our lives. As Christians, you know, we come every Sunday to celebrate an impactful event in our life. The day that Jesus came into our lives and we got saved. So we come on Sundays or Wednesdays, but we should do it every day of the week just to celebrate and remember the most impactful moment of our lives was not the day that our parents gave birth to us, but it was the day that we were born again. And on that day, we, we celebrate that. We came to a table with Jesus and he gave us something and he imparted something into our lives. And as you read through the Bible, you start realizing that almost every covenant, every promise of the Lord was marked or sealed or transferred through what we would call a cup. I mean, the, the, at the feast of the Passover, uh, and your children are learning about this over in Worship Center Kids today. They're learning about the cedar meal. And at the, the Passover, they, they would celebrate the Passover. They would set five cups out. Now, they wouldn't drink all five because the fifth cup is a cup that none of us want to drink or should drink, but it was the cup that we should have drank. It was the cup of wrath. And they would open up the door and they would throw what, that cup out. But then they, at the table, they would have four cups remaining. And they would drink that throughout the meal. And then Jesus comes. And at the Last Supper, Jesus is gathered together with his disciples in an upper room. And he gathers them there. And he begins to talk to them about an event that's getting ready to happen. And he says... There, he says, you know, this, is, this bread represents my body, and my body is broken for you, but they don't realize what is getting ready to happen. They're just hearing this word from Jesus that his body is going to be broken, and they aren't, it's not calculating. And then he takes a cup, and he says, and this cup is the new covenant in my blood which was shed for you. And then he, they, they pass this around, and then he gives an instruction. He says in Luke 22, that as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. As many times as you need to. It's not just one day out of the year. It's not, you know, one time every 10 years. But every time that you need to be reminded of what I did for you, you go to the table, and you get bread, and you get a cup. 
And you remind yourself. Now, we in the church, have, we've taken grape juice, we take wine, we do all that. And if you're online, grab some Skittles and a Propel or grab a Pepsi or whatever you got in the car. Just keep your eyes open. But it's the elements, it's the significance of what Jesus did for us. Not exactly what we are imparting into our bodies, but it's reminding ourselves that Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. And he was broken so that we wouldn't have to be broken. And he shed his blood for us so that we could be born again and have the remission of our sins in our lives. And everything that the cross afforded for us, we go to the table of the Lord to be reminded of that. And if you're in this room and you find yourself thinking, man, I'm defeated or I'm depressed or a disease is overrunning my body, you need to slide up to the table of the Lord and do it as often as you have to to remind yourself that it is by his stripes you are healed. By the chastisement of your peace was upon him. He was bruised for your iniquities. Whatever it is in your life, you just slide up to the table to remind yourself as often as you need to remind yourself, hey, I'm going to be healed. I'm going to be delivered. I'm going to be set free. So you slide up to that table and you you take communion you take the cup and you remind yourself of what Jesus Christ did for you and you have to do it because the enemy is going to be lying to you whispering in your ear doctors are going to be talking to you there's going to be enough negativity going into your mind you got to slide up to the table to remind yourself that Jesus Christ paid a price for you and now you inherit that in your life and so I want to just cover over the next few weeks this what the cup means to us and we're going to get down and nitty gritty, but what Jesus did and what the Bible confronts is the four major areas where people struggle. People in the world struggle and people in the church struggle. We struggle. We go through the same things. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. The difference is, is when it rains in our lives, what does it produce? And when it rains in their lives, what does it produce? You can't stop the rain, but you can control what the harvest is, the seeds that you plant, so that when it does rain in your life, that it produces good things and not evil things. And so we, we all struggle with things. We all go through the death of loved ones. We go through betrayal. We go through people lying about us, people gossiping about us, people manipulating, all kinds of those things. We all go through those things, whether you're in the church or out of the church. We all humans deal with four major areas of life. And I'm going to use biblical terms because we're in a church and we use the Bible, but we, we struggle with sin and getting free from sin. Both out there in the world and in the church, we struggle with sin, getting free from sin. We struggle with things that have us bound up. We struggle in getting deliverance from bondage. We struggle in remaining and staying free. We're saved, but we still have struggles in our lives. We struggle with finding our purpose. What is the will of God for my life? What is the purpose of God on my life? Then we, we struggle, and human beings struggle in living a life of fulfillment, being fulfilled. If you don't recognize that our world is struggling for fulfillment, just look at what we've taken on as pleasure now in our world. We're, we're digressing down as a society, as human beings. We're digressing down. We are taking pleasure and fulfillment in other people's pain. We, we struggle to find fulfillment, purpose, getting free, and being set free from sin. And so we have these four main areas that man struggles with. But then in God's great way, God bring, always confronts the areas that man struggles in. And so God, through the cup, gives us a key to victory in every area that we struggle in. Getting free from sin, being released and being set free, getting out of bondages, finding the purpose for our life and living a life filled with fulfillment. But when God begins to speak to us, when he was there at that, the, the last supper with the disciples, when he spoke to them there, it had not happened yet. He was presenting them a promise. You can look at the Last Supper and call that a place of promise. He said, this is my body which is broken for you, but his body hadn't been broken. He said, this cup is the new covenant which is my blood which is shed for you, but it hadn't been shed yet. He's telling them, hey, there's a promise for you. Here is the promise. Even though it hasn't happened yet, here's the promise. And that's how God always meets us. God meets us always in a place of promise. Now, for you and I, it's a place of struggle. It's a place of defeat. It's when we're in disease. It's when we're in sickness and God shows up in our life. It's a place of promise for God, but it's a place of struggle for us. But because we're in the struggle, we need a promise. 
See, a lot of people don't think that God speaks to people who are in sin. God doesn't speak to people who are in addiction. God doesn't speak to people who are in depression. No, no. I'll tell you that God speaks to those people as clearly as he speaks to us church people. Why? Because they need to hear the voice of the Lord in the middle of their situation and they need a promise from God that it doesn't have to always be this way and it, because he has a way out of it. Matter of fact, let me, let me prove that to you. Found in Exodus chapter 6, I want to read three verses to you. Uh, verse 5, verse 6, and verse 7 out of Exodus chapter 6. And, and just, just to, to prove my point, the book of Exodus is about a coming out. That means that they were in somewhere that they shouldn't be. So the Lord speaks and he says, And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. So these are people that are in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, while they're in bondage, say this to them. I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So God delivers promises to his people when they're in bondage. When they're suffering. When, they don't, when they're, they're down to the point where they're now groaning about their problems. And all of us have to come to that point. I don't know about you, but have you ever tried to help somebody who doesn't really want to be helped? So you go pull them out because you, want, you know that God's got a better life for them. So you go pull them out and you get them on their feet and then they go right back into it. So let me just put it like this so nobody thinks I'm talking about them. You go down there, they're in the mud puddle. You see them in the mud. You know it's not the will of God for them to be in the mud. So you reach down, you pull them up out of the mud. You spend all kinds of money and effort and getting towels and showers and everything. And you don't want to get them cleaned up and they dive right back into the mud. And you go, no, no, that's not where you're supposed to be. So you pull them back up out of the mud. You wash them all off and then they dive right back into the mud. It's like having children. But eventually, they'll come to a point where they're asking for you to pull them out of the mud puddle. And when they, so they get tired of being there. They start groaning. That they realize, I'm not supposed to be here. I, God's never designed me to live in the mud. God's never designed me to live in this lifestyle. God didn't design me to live in this addiction. God didn't design me to live with this depression. And so now they get to a point where I'm tired of living this way. And they begin to groan or they begin to talk to God. And God says, I hear you in the middle of your captivity. And I have a promise for you. I'll bring you out of that. So they start groaning about their bondage. They're upset about it. And so the Lord begins to give them promises. He says, first, I will free you from your oppression. We can say that that's salvation. We can say that that's sanctification. But the Lord said, I will free you from their bondage. I'm going to save you. Salvation. Then he says, I will rescue you from slavery. I'm going to and so he said, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. I'm going to liberate you. I'm going to save you. Then I'm going to liberate you. Then he says, I will redeem you with a powerful arm. So I'm going to save you. I'm going to liberate you. Now I'm going to redeem you. Then he says, and I will take you as my own people. I'm going to adopt you. We are the sons of God by adoption. We've been grafted into the body of Christ. And I love that because in our world today right now, we have birth parents giving up their children at record paces. But the beauty of adoption is, is that once you legally adopt somebody, you can never terminate rights. And so he's stuck with me as long as I'm willing to let him be my father. He's stuck with me. He can never terminate rights. He has adopted me in. And so we praise the Lord because we've now been adopted. He took us on as his own people through the blood of Jesus Christ in our lives. So he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you. I'm going to liberate you. I'm going to redeem you. And then I'm going to adopt you. And now because you're adopted, we would say that this cup is a cup of praise. Because now that we were our adopted, see, when I was first born, the only inheritance I had was death. For the wages of sin is death. I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And so my only, the only thing I had rights to was to die and to go to hell. But now that Jesus has come and he's adopted me into the body of Christ, I now 
now get an inheritance. And the earnest of our inheritance is the Holy Spirit. And now I'm a joint heir with Christ. So now that I'm adopted in, I get to inherit all the riches and the glory of heaven and earth. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. So in Exodus, when the Lord begins to speak to them, you, this wasn't the fulfillment of the promise. This was the delivering of the promise. I'm going to speak this to you. How God then brought that about was through what we call the Passover. He said, I'm going to bring you out through these great judgments. We call them plagues, but they were actually judgments on Pharaoh and the people of Egypt for keeping God's people in bondage. How many of you are ready for God to issue a judgment against the enemy who's keeping you in bondage? Let me ask that a different way. How many of you are ready for God to issue a judgment on the enemy of your soul who's keeping your child in bondage? We have these great and precious promises, and I believe that we're in a season right now where God is waiting on his people to step up and receive his word into their life and be reminded of the promises of God and then release God to do what only God can do. And when God begins to do it, he'll rain down judgment on the enemy of your soul who's already defeated, and there'll be a releasing of your children and your children's children. Because Acts chapter 2 and verse 39 says, this promise is unto you and your children and your children's children and as many as the Lord our God shall call. So I believe that right now God is speaking and when God begins to speak, I'm going to release some great judgments. And what he did to Pharaoh, I mean, he just ratcheted up and and don't start itching, but they started sending fleas and lice and then there was frogs and uh, all that kind of stuff and craziness. And then Pharaoh just kept hardening his heart. He must have been one tough dude. It would have been all over for me Right at the beginning. I'm, I give. I'm not that hard. It's just, you just take, just go. Please leave. Get out. They don't. So God says, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to send one last judgment. And if you want to avoid this judgment, you have to go get a spotless lamb, sacrifice that lamb, and apply the blood of that lamb to your doorpost. And when the death angel passes over and he sees the blood, he'll continue to pass on over. But if he doesn't see the blood, then he's going to take the firstborn child of that house. And so it was called the Passover. And after they got out of there, they then instituted this meal to celebrate the fact that through God's judgment on their enemy, they were released up out of it. Now, this is where the devil loves to twist this around. We feel like we're living under the judgment of God, but God judges our enemy to release us into the promises of God. The devil would have you to believe that God puts judgments on you. No, no, God has judged him and already defeated him and already told us that he's a liar and he's setting you free through his promises in your life. And so they began to celebrate this fact that God brought them out of slavery, brought them into freedom and redemption and then fulfillment. They finally found out that there's a promised land for them to inherit. This is what they celebrated through these four cups. And those same ideas, principles, and promises are significant to us. They hold the same ideas for us as the people of God. That his promises are yea and they are amen in our lives. And God wants to bring you out. God wants to save you. God wants to liberate you. God wants to redeem you. God wants to adopt you into his body. But I believe more than any time ever in my life, I believe that we are in a season of deliverance. Now, I I grew up in church where deliverance was a dirty word and a dirty business. We didn't want deliverance in the church, and because we didn't want deliverance in the church, we now have people steeped in bondage. They're saved, but they're bound. They come to church, and they worship, but they're bound. They they, they go home, and they have the SIWC shirt on, and we go through the motions of it, but we're bound. And because we're bound, we cannot do the purpose of God for our lives, and then we don't live a fulfilled life because we are bound up. And in Exodus chapter 6, God gives these four promises. You can compare. Exodus chapter 26 to Matthew 28 in the Great Commission and see that God's desire was for the promises that he gave to his people in Exodus chapter 6 is the requirement and the commission of the modern church is to take those promises through the cup of Jesus Christ out to a lost and a dying world. And he says go therefore Matthew 28. He said go. And the reason why the church cannot go is because we are bound. And they can't get to where they
where the church is is because they're bound. And so we have two entities that are bound up and neither entity should be bound up because Jesus Christ came to set every person free. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, he said the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and you might have life more abundantly. So Jesus' will is that every person, whether they sit in the church or they're out there, is that every person would come to repentance, be saved, be liberated, for live a purposeful, filled life in every aspect of their life. Instead, the church is bound up and we cannot go out there. So the church has adopted a philosophy that if they need Jesus, they'll come here. If they're hurt, they'll come here. If they're broken, they'll come here. If they're addicted, they'll come here. No, no, they're not supposed to come here. We're supposed to go out there. You remember these words Jesus said to Peter? He said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church should be on the move and running towards the gates of hell. Gates do not move and gates serve a purpose. The gates, the gates have a purpose of keeping some things in and other things out. So the gates of hell are designed to keep the church out and to keep lost people bound up in their sin and in their depression and in their disease. But Jesus said, you the church should go and where do we go we go storm the gates of hell and we take the cup of salvation to people who are behind those gates and liberate them and bring them out to the other side they don't have to live there anymore they need to live on this side and then go back and storm the gates with us now, I don't know if you've ever been in revival before. I don't know if you've ever been in church where, I mean, the God just begins to move and the Holy Spirit begins to go. But let me, let me just, just open up the playbook for you. We're in revival and we're storming the gates of hell. This church over the last 12 months has grown by almost 700 people. So we're in revival. God's moving. Our baptismal record is filling up faster than we have room for. So that's called revival. But don't be ignorant of the devil's devices. You're running with a cup. It's the cup of salvation. It's the cup that Jesus gave for you. You were meant to drink the cup of wrath, but instead Jesus said, I'll take the cup of wrath and I'll give you a cup of life. But what I'm seeing now though is the church is adopting a philosophy of wrath. We want God to judge people based on the sins that we deem in unredeemable. If they're steeped in sexual immorality, we say, get them, God. If they're steeped in addiction, we say, get them, God. And God's saying, I want to get them, but I'm not wanting to get them like you want me to get them. You want me to judge them. You want me to kill them. You want me to destroy them. I want you to go with a cup and pour a cup of salvation over their life so that I can get them and I can save them and I can redeem them and I can liberate them. And ultimately, I want to adopt them into the body of Christ. Yes. Amen. Good. Amen. So he said, you need to go. But as we're going in revival, the heat turns up. The devil starts warring. And whoever told us Christians that, man, living for Jesus is easy. <laughs> I think they worked for the devil. <laughs> living for God can be hard. Let me tell you the secret. If you'll live for God, life will get easier. But if you want to live life hard, living for God ain't that easy. But what happens is we're carrying this cup. We got, we got a, we're supposed to have our shield of faith. We're supposed to have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray without ceasing. We're supposed to be doing all that. But as we go, we start storming the gates of hell, and hell launches an attack against us. And he punches us in the gut. You're trying to have revival, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the devil takes one of your children in captivity. You're, you're on your way to revival, and all of a sudden, one of your family members dies unexpectedly. You're, you're on your way to revival, and all of a sudden, somebody betrays you. Somebody lies about you. Somebody writes a dumb Facebook post about you. Somebody accuses you of something you would never even dream of doing. But now that it's out there, what you do, and what all of us do is when we get sucker punched, is we drop everything, and we take cover like this. Now, we're still standing there at the gates of hell, and now we're still running because we don't know what else to do. But we've dropped the purpose for which we were going in there for. And now we go in there to meet lost people who are in the same position we are and we no longer have what we were originally carrying. We're no longer empowered the way that we were empowered because now we've covered up to avoid any more punches that may be coming at us from the enemy. And now when we meet lost people, we no longer have a cup to offer them. We now offer them nothing but our misery, our trial, and we commiserate in pain with each other. When you get there, 
And I've told some of you into your face that when you get there, you ought to make the devil pay for what he's done to you. You ought to make him pay for ever laying eyes on your child. You go redeem every child you can find to make the devil, you make the mark here. That Listen, I, the reason why we started healing nights is that the devil's going to take out my father. Then my goodness, we're going to heal every person I come in contact with cancer. And when I say I, I'm going to heal, I mean Jesus is going to heal. We're going to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I'm going to make the devil pay that he ever laid eyes on Michael McKenna Sr. And some of you need to get that bold back inside of you that I have the promises of God and the promises of God are yea and they are amen and I know who I am I know in whom I have believed it and I am persuaded that he is able as much as God has a plan for you the devil has a plan he has a plan to keep people under his control, under his wraps, under his authority, thereby controlling you, telling you there's no way out. And I believe that today is a day of deliverance. And you're saved, but it's time to get delivered. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you can be saved and on your way to heaven, but still have a mindset that is not godly. A mindset that believes the lies of the enemy more than you believe in the truth of the word of God. Now, when we talk about deliverance, and I say, well, today is the day of deliverance, automatically us church folk will say, well, but I, I don't have what they have. <laughs> that guy needs deliverance, but me, I'm, I'm good. What about deliverance from bitterness? Yeah, right. Might I say to you, some of you have tried to prune back your bitterness. And all you've done is allowed it to grow even more forceful because you can't prune back bitterness. Bitterness must be plucked up, removed out of your life. And the only one that can do that is Christ. What about being delivered from envy? Covetousness. What about being delivered from a gossiping spirit? Well, Pastor, we're just going to pray, which is code for I want to know. Y'all been around church people, right? What can I pray with you about? <laughs> Let me give you all an idea of a response to that, right? When you don't know how to pray, the Spirit will make intercession, so go intercede. You don't need to know, just pray. You want to know because you want to talk. <laughs> I'll just step right on them eggshells and crack them. But, you know, we got to talk about this stuff, man. We church people present ourselves to be more holy than what we actually are. Matter of fact, we got more bondages in the church than they got in the world. At least they're supposed to be in bondage, if you will, and we're not. We're supposed to be set free. And what happens when you're in bondage, whether you have bitterness or envy or strife, gossiping, lying, you have a sexual bondage, you have a drug bondage, you have an alcohol bondage, you, whatever that bondage is, I think some people have a religious bondage. Yeah. Methodologies, man, if Jesus you know, healed somebody the same way, Jesus, listen, if Jesus spit in the, in, the, in the mud three times in the Bible and every person that he did it to was healed, we would have all kinds of stuff up here to spit into and rub it in your eye. We believe in the methodologies of church and how church is set up and not in God anymore. Well, if, if that guy prays for me, if that guy's leading, you've just set up an idol. The power is not in these people up here. The power is in God. He's the healer. He's the way maker. He's the peace speaker. He's the joy giver. And so the idea, what happens when you get into bondage is that God is somehow very far from you. But the reality is that God is very, very near to you. He's very close to you. And he wants to deliver you. He wants to bring you out and set you apart. And God does not want you to live in condemnation. John 10.10 10 has probably been my life verse for the last 20 years. Because I believe that the life that he's talking about is, he said, I come to give you life. And I come to give you life more abundantly. Life twice. And I like to use the acronym with life, living in freedom every day. Not just here when I'm here at the 11 o'clock or when I'm watching online or streaming and all. To be set free, delivered, changed completely in my life.
forever, every day of my life, to give, to give me life and to give me life more abundantly. And so what happens is, is when we get delivered, is God frees us from the enslavement of sin. He delivers us from the mindset of sin. That's true deliverance. And this is not just a one-time battle either. It's an everyday battle. Everyday battle. God, take me out of the mindsets. Because when I can get alone, my brain never shuts off. How many of you, you can hear that one song? And it'll just take you right back to where you were in 1963 with your tie-dye shirt on and your bandana. You're like, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't born then. You're going to have to tell me about it. <laughs> just like that, I snapped that right there. But every now and then, just, the devil just play that right tune. And you have a mindset change. And you got to slide up to the table and be reminded of what Christ did in your life. And take communion. To be delivered, freed from it. Delivered from mindsets that we develop while we're enslaved to sin. And deliverance is a promise to you and to me. Then he says, I'm going to redeem you. I'm gonna, I'm, then I'm going to adopt you. I want to bring you out of these things. All through this cup. And as you read the Bible, the cup becomes a metaphor for an individual's fate. You can, you can have people who talk about their life and you, you, we say, oh, they're, they're a cup half empty person. Or they're a cup half full person. But in the church, that's the wrong mindset. The psalmist begin to use this metaphor of the cup as the fate of one's life. In Psalm 16, he said, he said he credit God with the assigning of his portion and cup in his life. Then in Psalm 23, he tells us that the half cup full, the half cup empty is not how we are. We are a cup that runneth over people. It runs over to the point where it just begins to spill out into other people's lives. And they, it creates a thirst in their life. And listen, we want to keep giving them a drink. What we need to do is hand them a cup so that they can go get filled up with the presence of God in their own life. Then in Psalm 116, the psalmist raises the cup of salvation as a thank you offering to God. In effect, he's saying to the Lord, the sum of my life is because of you. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I mean, some of us want to brag about the cup we have, the blessings that we have. But you wouldn't even have a cup if it wasn't for God. So everything that you are is because of God. Everything that you want to be is because of God. Every blessing in your life is because of God. You got breath in your body because of God. You got health in your body because of God. You in your right mind this morning, unless you're a Cubs fan, you in your right mind this morning because of the grace of God in your life. Just making sure you're still listening to what I'm saying before you ask. Like, oh, what do you say? I don't want amen now. We, everything we've got is because of God. I mean, people talk about, oh, pastor, look at this. But no, no, it's because of the grace of God you drive that car. It's because of the grace of God your children are healthy. It's because of the grace of God you even got those kids. It's the grace of God you got that job. So before you curse it, you need to realize it's a blessing. But just like life itself, the metaphor of the cup, while the psalmist portrayed it as positive, it can be negative. The cup can function as a cup of blessing or as a cup of wrath. It can be a vessel pouring out God's judgment on the nations or it can be pouring out God's favor in your life. That he would open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings you not have room enough to receive. Isaiah personified Jerusalem as a woman in Isaiah 51 and verse 17 as a woman who drained the cup of wrath to its dregs. She, she just kept drinking it down until there was nothing left. That's the world we live in right now. Just drink it down till there's nothing left. So in, a, in such a pit. Jeremiah records that God would force all the nations to drink from his cup and then stagger to their destruction. No one would be able to refuse it, and all humanity would be judged, and the wicked would be put to the sword, the cup. Ezekiel returns to the image of the cup of Jerusalem. If you want to read a brutally explicit passage of Scripture, go read what Ezekiel talks about with the image of the cup of Jerusalem. Zechariah uses the image of the cup of wrath to depict the fate of the enemies of Jerusalem. He says in, in Zechariah 12 and 2 that Jerusalem is actually the cup. The author of Revelation returns 
to the dark image of the cup of wrath, threatening all those who follow the beast with the wine of God's judgment in Revelation 14 and verse 10. For the church, the cup isn't a cup of wrath. I mean, we were rightfully supposed to drink a cup of wrath, but Jesus came. And when Jesus came, because this cup now is the central message of everything that we believe. It represents everything that we as a Christian believes. This is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we take the cup of communion to remind ourselves of what the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ reminds us of in our lives. But Jesus comes, and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane prior to the crucifixion. And he says, and he's praying, and he says to the Lord, Lord, if it be your will, would you let this cup pass from me? It's the cup of wrath that he's talking about. Even Jesus didn't want to drink the cup of wrath. He said, I know it's the will of God that I do this. I'm here to take the cup of wrath that everybody sitting here and everybody watching online, everybody everywhere, every man, boy, child, girl, woman, everybody was supposed to drink the cup of wrath. But Jesus came. He took that cup out of all of our hands and said, don't drink that. It's bad for you. Instead, I'll drink all of your cups of wrath and through the cross of Calvary, I'll transform a cup of wrath into a cup of life. I'll give you a different cup for you to drink. And we need to be reminded every day of our lives that what we have here we don't rightfully deserve. But for the grace of God and the mercy of God, I no longer have a cursing cup, but I have a blessing cup in my life. I have a cup of life and of redemption and adoption that I get to drink, and I'm going to drink it every day of my life. Paul began to speak about communion. He spoke of a cup of blessing. He said, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. He's, he's talking about they used to sacrifice to idols. And he's, he's talking to the Corinthian church. He said, we don't sacrifice like that, amen. That's physical meat. Let's talk about spiritual meat. And there's no more deepness or richness or truth than taking of communion. To be reminded of what Christ has done in our lives. It's oneness as a body. We may not have anything else in common with each other. Except for this. It brings us at a table together to remind us that it is because of Christ that we even sit at that table. Paul begins to lay it out and he's saying, listen, I I need you to understand something. And our culture is so different. So there are things that happen in the Bible that we don't understand. And our meals are very impersonal. We get together, we set out silverware, we set out places, and we, we set chairs up and all that. But in their day, they would kneel down at a table. No silverware. And whatever else was on the plate, they would pass bread. And each person would grab a hold of that bread and they would tear a chunk of that bread off. They ate of the same bread. See, in our day, we're like, did you wash your hands? Where, what did you do before you touched my bread? And if you touched the bread, we're, it's very impersonal. You got cooties, you got germs. You uh, use that utensil. Now you don't recognize this, but we do this in worship right now. Instead of getting personal with God and sitting at a table with God and breaking off a priest and handing it to each person, we use the utensils of worship to replace. A personal relationship with Jesus. Because if we can keep him at a distance, then he won't know our lives. If I can keep you out of my home, then you won't know the dirt of my house. So I want to use the utensils to keep it impersonal. And Jesus said, I want you to get to this so we can get personal with one another. And not only personal with him and you, but personal with one another. We are the same body. We're unified together. We eat of the same bread. We drink of the same cup. Because they would take that bread as they tore it off, and then they would pass the cup. And each person who had taken a piece of bread would then sop that in there 
they were common. They were unified in agreeing that the promises of God, they were yea and they were amen. As we were singing, Pastor Evan was singing this song, the Lord just began to speak to me about this service. I never want to try to give you what I gave the 9 o'clock because you're not the 9 o'clock. But in this service, I want us to take communion in faith. Faith that the promises of salvation, of liberation, of redemption, and adoption are for the person in your life who is not here with you. We all have this in common. We have somebody in our life who the devil has warred with and has put them into chains. But today we take communion to be reminded that the same God who set us free, the same God who saved us, the same God who liberated us, the same God who redeemed us, and the same God who adopted us made a promise not just to us, but also to our children and to our children's children, to all those who are far off, that the same God who did it for us is going to do it for them. And so if you have your cup, how these work is you just take the little tab and you pop it down. Those of you that are joining online, if you'll grab the element that you have for bread, may that be a skittle, a, a whale, a goldfish, whatever you have in your car. I just want you to take that. We're the body of Christ. We take his the body was broken for you. Everything you would ever have need of in your life and everything that that person you have in your mind right now that needs the body of Christ, this provided. Healing, deliverance, peace, joy. And so in your own way, if you would just take and be reminded that the body of Christ is the answer for their lives. Now, if you just take that tab and you just pull it all the way back. Let me, let me just try to give you an image. That person that you're thinking about, or maybe it's your life, written on the chalkboard is all the things you've done wrong. You lied, you sinned, you cheated, you committed adultery, you committed fornication, you stole, you gossiped, you were a hypocrite, or whatever that is. It's written on that chalkboard. And the devil has you writing it on that chalkboard a hundred times a day, just like that old nasty school teacher. Just write it up there and be reminded, be reminded of all the bad stuff you've ever done in your life. And then while you're writing all that on that chalkboard, and everybody who walks by that chalkboard sees everything you've ever done in your life, all of a sudden Jesus walks in, and he's got that sponge just filled with water, and he just begins to wash away that chalkboard. And every, now every person who comes in doesn't see anything that you've ever done or anything that was written against you or any sin you have ever committed, any lie you've ever told, because the blood of Jesus just poured over that chalkboard and washed away everything that was written against you. That's what the, Paul wrote to the church. He said he took the ordinances that were written against you, and he nailed them to the cross of Calvary, causing you to be victorious in your life. And so as we take this, be reminded that every sin in your life is washed away. And may this same promise go to that person who is in bondage right now. May the blood of Jesus show up in their life and wipe out sin stain and liberate them and deliver them right now in Jesus' name. Would you take the cup?